Director, Chairperson, senior members, and my dear friends. At the outset, I sincerely thank the organizers for. And what has the structure of this particular molecule to do with the activity or the function? And I'll also tell you about the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamic profile of this molecule. You always like to compare it with something which you already know. So comparative data with other DPP-4 inhibitors, and I'll end up with that. So to introduce this particular topic, as you know, DPP-4 inhibitors are wonderful molecules of this decade, and they act by enhancing the endogenous or a physiological levels of incretin, and it acts as a blood glucose-dependent insulinotropic drug with lowest hypoglycemia and weight neutrality, which are the highlights of this molecule, and we have already had some experience with other molecules like citagliptin, vildagliptin, saxagliptin, linagliptin, and allogliptin. But we are yet to have the hands-on experience with this particular new molecule, which is yet to be launched here in the Indian market, but it is already there in the uh, Japanese market for the last two years. And each molecule has something unique and so good, and probably that is why so many gliptins are still in the market. And this also appears to be quite a good molecule. However, the experiences of our own, as well as the test of time, should decide the fate of the molecule. To just wrap up the physiology, what is this incretin effect? So this is the extra insulin secretion. Whenever you get a glucose load in the GIT, when compared to a glucose load in the intravenous system. So that means God has de decided or planned in such a way that the GAT, which would respond much more better than any other system of entry of glucose into the body. And this is mediated through the incretins. Now, whenever you compare the glucose, insulin, and glucagon in a normal individual, whenever you have a carbohydrate meal, the glucose goes up slightly on the higher side and this is mainly because of the insulin secretion and the suppression of glucagon. But in a diabetic, it doesn't happen that way. So there is a higher increase in the blood glucose, and there is a blunting of the first phase and probably the second phase also in the insulin secretion, and there is a reciprocal increase of glucagon. And with this, to compensate, God has given the incretin. And this incretin, the GLP-1 and GAP, mediate through the alpha and the beta cells and see to it that the glycemic control is good. And of course, you need something to balance out this particular incretin. Otherwise, there may be a one-sided approach with gliptins, with uh, GLP-1 and G GAP. So DPP-4 enzyme is a thing which balances out this particular gastrointestinal hormone. And our scope is mainly to deal with this and probably squash this or probably hold this on so that the GLP-1 or the GAP would act better. So what is the structure of this particular molecule to do with the activity? If you happen to see, there are the three important sites which it blocks. And the most important site is that S2 extensive site wherein the bonding is a little more stronger and it is really powerful. And this is mainly because of its piperazine moiety, the five-ring rigid J-shaped structure, and binding interaction at this S2 subsite by the carbonyl moiety. And this particular block at the S2 sub, uh, extensive site is available with the citagliptin also, but other molecules don't have this. And when you look at the uh, inhibitory concentration of this molecule, it is surprisingly very low when compared to its requirement for suppressing DPP-8 and 9. So you have a very good safety margin 
between 0.8 and 189, the, which is, or 150, which is the closest entity. In that way, we are benefited that a molecule which no, will not uh, suppress DPP-8 or DPP-9 and FAP and safely suppress DPP-4 at the desired level of action. How, what about the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics? So in the dosage uh, studies, they have found 10 milligram, 20 milligram, and 40 milligrams, and found that 20 milligrams are equally effective, and this has been the recommended dosage of this particular molecule, which offers a half-life of about 24 hours, saying that this molecule could be a once-a-day molecule. And when you view it after about a couple of days, you would take at least seven days for it to develop a steady state level with which you can have a profound action of the molecule. And when you take up the relationship to meal, it is not altered by the meal that it is taken before or after a meal. So necessitating uh, that it should be taken for before meal or after meal does not arise with this molecule. Very often our patients, even if you advise them to take it before meal, they forget, go for a meal, and then they realize sometimes they skip or probably take it on the after meal. So this does not have any relationship to a meal. So that's one plus point in this molecule. The second important thing is the percentage of its disposal via kidney as well as for the liver. So it's almost 50-50. Thereby, you have the advantage of the renal safety as well as hepatic safety much more than any other compound of this particular category. Next comes the blockade and the level of the blockade. The level of inhibition is quite adequate with 10 milligrams as well as 20 milligrams when compared to placebo. And this gives rise to an adequate amount of the DPP enhancement at various meals. So this is the placebo and this is the enhancement of the incretins at various meals. Now, having understood this, what about the HOMA B? Uh, does this molecule do anything about the beta cell mass? Yes. In the clinical trials so far done, you've been able to identify that there has been an increase in the HOMA B, which is an indicator of the beta cell activity. Now, what are the clinical trials which are available at the moment? And these clinical trials I have classified into monotherapy and in combination with other OADs and in certain special populations like renal and hepatic compromised state. So taking the monotherapy, it is a efficacy and safety study, and it's a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial for a short period in Japanese, and this is a four-week single-blinded and 12-week double-blinded study, and what are the inferences? There has been a very good reduction in the hemoglobin A1C, as well as the fasting blood glucose. Normally, you don't get that much of benefit in a fasting value in any gliptin for that matter, because more of gliptin's action is seen in the postprandial state. And the second monotherapy trial was in drug naive patients, wherein you always get, it's almost like a virgin uh, sand or a virgin soil. You get the best out of this, and you really feel the effect of a drug when you give it to a drug naive patient. So this is again an initial therapy for the newly diagnosed, and in this particular study, you assess the baseline and the three months values, which tell you that the hemoglobin A1C reduction has been almost 2%, and the fasting blood glucose reduction adequate almost 40 milligrams, and the HOMA B also improvement is quite adequate, all are significant statistically. But probably we may not expect this to be the first drug uh, or first line management drug, but at least when you know the real efficacy of a molecule in a virgin patient, probably it will be very useful to plan it as a second line of treatment as usually recommended by the AD and other regulatory authorities. Coming to the combination trials, a combination with all the combinations which we normally go in, a metformin combination, a glimepiride combination, a pioglutazone combination, and also with insulin combination. Let us see the metformin combination. Metformin, as you know, will be the first line of management, and it also has some amount of incretin-based action. So probably this would enhance that particular entity much better. And this is again to evaluate the 
efficacy and safety of this molecule when given in, along with metformin. And it is a two-week single-blinded and a 16-week double-blinded study, which is a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study. So metformin on both arms and uh, this uh, teniliglipidin on one arm and placebo on the other. So whatever you subtract, you identify that it is due to this particular drug. What are the results? A hemoglobin A1C reduction, which is statistically significant, as well as a fasting blood glucose reduction, which is also significant from the baseline. And the change of, uh, ba from baseline uh, of uh, HOMA B is also quite significant, about which we are not very much worried about the metformin component, because that doesn't have much effect on the HOMA B. Coming to the glimepirate combination, this is again another combination wherein it is also an insotropic drug, but when you combine this and try to go ahead with the study, again a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial for 12 weeks double-blind and for 40 weeks uh, open-label trial. So you have an experience of about 52 weeks in this particular trial, and that has also given a placebo and a teniliglyptin, 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 whereas here this must be a placebo followed by uh, teniliglyptin, and finally, we have a very good reduction of hemoglobin A1C in the 52 period, weeks, and also the duration of uh, the durability of 52 weeks is also acceptable. And this particular uh, thing, we have the reduction of fasting blood glucose and the post glucose, which is more significant. Next is a combination pyoglodazone, which is a useful combination of almost like an insulinotropic drug and an insulin sensitizer. And this is also a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial for a similar period of almost 52 weeks. And the trial also revealed a good reduction of hemoglobin A1C when compared with the placebo arm. And the glucose reduction in the postprandial state, which is mostly due to the insulotropic drug rather than the insulin sensitizer, was marked and statistically significant. Coming to the insulin combination, the design was a smaller group of 26 patients Continuous glucose monitoring was done for seven days, of which one to three days, which was only insulin and the probably an OHA for control, and teniliglipidin was added on after, from the fourth day to seventh day, 20 milligrams at breakfast. And uh, the estimations were done, a 24-hour glucose estimation, as well as postprandial and MAGE, glycemic uh, kind of, uh, area under curve of blood glucose curve after two hours, and the proportion of time spent in appropriate glucose control, hypoglycemia period as well as hyperglycemia period in the CGMS. And glycated albumin has been done because the duration of the study was very small. And there's a 1,5 anhydroglucitol, which is again a marker for the glycemic variability. So what are the results? There has been a significant reduction in the fasting postprandial and also the mean 24-hour blood glucose and reduction in the MAGE an increase in the proportion of time in normal glycemia, less with hyperglycemia, and no difference in hypoglycemia. And a significant reduction in the glycated albumin, and an increase in 1,5-anhydroglucitol. Uh, so this is seen in the graph, wherein there is a, this is an already existing pro profile or a regimen, wherein when it is added after 24 hours, the graph has come down this way, and after 48 hours and three days, is remaining in the same range. And this also tells you that there has been a reduction in the glycated albumin, and also there is an increase in the 1,5-AG uh, levels, which indicates a good glycemic variability. Coming to the special population, uh, in groups with end-stage renal disease on hemodialysis, as well as in hepatic impairment. And this is a, still more a smaller study and in which it has been grouped into two, 28 weeks, two centers, and 43 patients have been uh, randomized, and the effects were seen in 28 weeks. What were the results? The results show that there has been a decrease in the blood glucose level, and there has been a decrease when compared to the previous molecules like Wuglibose or Vildagliptin, and you will also see a reduction in the hemoglobin albumin, glycated albumin, and also the glycated albumin reduction whenever there's a switchover from Wuglibos and Vildagliptin. So telling us that there has been a reduction in the hemoglobin A1C as well as in the same com conversion group. So when you have the AE to be grouped, there has been no hypoglycemia on any of these patients. 
and only one patient had an increased dose of uh, laxative and no patient had to discontinue the treatment and there has been a slight increase in weight probably this is not an ideal situation to observe and finally the, the type 2 diabetic patient on hemodialysis when on teniliglipine had an effective glycemic control it was, and it was quite safe, well tolerated and more effective than the other two molecules. When you take up the hepatic impairment, which is grouped into a healthy person as well as a mild and moderate hepatic impairment, in three groups, eight patients in each arm, teniliglipine when it was given, the boundary was allocated by the ADA, FDA was about 200 percent, whereas the confidence interval, which, was, which this particular molecule was remaining, was well within that. Hence, there was no advice or requirement to reduce the dose of this particular molecule. This is a very useful help because uh, situation in our treatment armamentorium because sometimes we give a molecule and a prescription and the patient takes it for long number of months and years and probably if he has developed a renal problem or a hepatic problem that should not be of any uh, contraindicated situation. So tablets like this would be able to be acceptable even if the patient goes in for such problems also. So ultimately the safety and tolerability, the AE profile is not significantly different from placebo and no hypoglycemia was reported and though 10% of patients had AE, it was not drug related AE, AE and the most common AE was hypoglycemia and 3% and constipation in about 9.9% and always there is a caution when we are combining it with some other medications, uh, other diabetic uh, drugs and intestinal obstruction particularly in any ingredient based therapy and, but nothing had really gone wrong and QT prolongation is also not a concern but still we have to be cautious with larger, larger studies and then go ahead. Now comparing this with uh, other molecules of DPP-4 inhibitors, it is really striking to see uh, inhibitory concentration of 0.9 when compared to all other molecules which in linagliptin which comes almost a little closer all other molecules are leaps and bounds <coughs> above this particular range. So also in vitro as well as in vivo it is really closer to uh, the safest range when compared to the other DPP-4 inhibitors. The selectivity as I told you earlier is quite high with tenagliptin, citagliptin and alogliptin. And the plasma DPP-4 inhibition has been on the higher side with 24-hour post-dose in these three situations. Coming to the other aspect of excretion, this has a 50-50 excretion of 45.5 and 46.4. Hence, when it is particularly cleared out in a renal compromised individual or in a hepatic compromised individual, it is quite reasonably safe. And when you compare the hemoglobin A1C reduction, it is almost the same, but prime probably slightly more on with some, some of the other DPP-4 inhibitor. Primarily, you don't expect anything great from an OHA more than minus one percentage of hemoglobin A1C. So with that, you have one more advantage of no dose titration with problems like hepatic or renal entity, and the desired dose is 20 milligrams. So this is another advantage which I have already told you. So to summarize the little bit of evidences which we have had, a little bit of experiences which we have at the moment, this molecule appears to be a, a molecule with a promising molecule and a chemically a different structure and having a better binding which helps in a safer and a prolonged complete binding of the DPP-4 enzyme and unique interaction with uh, DPP-4 receptor, particularly the S2 uh, segment and the lowest inhibitory concentration which makes it a little more potent and longer half-life gives you a once a day regime which is again very useful for improving the compliance of the patient. The dual root elimination also helps us to try to give these patients even if they can have a mild renal or a compromised hepatic function. Lesser plasma glycemic excursions which we have observed in reducing the glycemic variability and also it improves the glycemic control even while the patient is on insulin or and even in an insulinic patient. So thank you very much for your patient listening and I am also with you to really await this molecule and try and have 
our own clinical experience of this molecule before the molecule achieves the gold status. Thank you.